Welcome to Andrew Womack Recorded Live, a weekly podcast featuring Andrew's latest live teaching sessions, along with his other classic teachings through the years. And now, here's Andrew. Praise God. If we could get everybody to come in and take a seat, somebody would yell down the hall and tell them to come in. That would be good. Praise the Lord. It's like herding cats to get everybody back after a break. A little hard to do. And I've already been blessed. I had a lot of people come up and talk about how much this is, uh, how much Pastor Bob blessed them. I tell you, that's just awesome. You know, we had one of our Bible college students. Um, we were over in um, Wales, and we were talking with Arthur Burt. I don't know if any of you know Arthur Burt. But he used to travel with Smith Wigglesworth, and at the time, he was 86. Now he's 97, I guess, 96 or 97, if he's still around. I hadn't heard from him in a year or two. But uh, anyway, it was really neat. And we had this one guy who didn't, you know, he wasn't one of our brightest students. And we were just sitting around talking to Arthur Burt, and, and it was so amazing. We were asking all of these questions, and there was just a lull in the conversation. And this guy comes up, and he says, what advice would you give to a young minister? And Arthur Burt says, listen to an old minister. <laughs> and that's nearly the same thing that Oral said. Uh, and, and it's really a true statement that what a privilege it is to glean that. And of course, Pastor Bob and Joe, how long have you guys been in ministry now? Well, we've been pastoring 24 years. But you've been in ministry for 50, 54, 54 years. They've been in ministry. You know, what a privilege. What an honor. And you know, doctrine is super important. I don't minimize that. But I've come to realize that anybody who's been in ministry 54 years, they, they've got a right to speak into your life just by virtue of the fact that they're still upright. <laughs> Amen. And that they're still loving God and they're still serving God. That's a miracle. It is a miracle. And boy, what a privilege, what an honor uh, to get all of that. So, man, that's exciting. I believe that that encouraged people. Let's turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Are there, is there anybody here uh, this morning who was not here last night when I started my teaching? Could I see your hand? If you weren't here last night. Praise the Lord. Quite a few of you. How many students do we have that are here today that weren't here last night? Praise the Lord. Well, we're glad that you got to come. We had a great time last night. I encourage you to get the teaching. But basically, I was just, I believe that the Lord wants me to encourage us this week to just really rejoice in the Lord, how important it is to rejoice. And I used a number of scriptures. One of them that I was focusing on was Paul said in Philippians 4.11, he had learned to be content. Rejoicing in the Lord is not just a natural byproduct of circumstances. When everything is good, you just automatically are rejoicing in the Lord. No, you can learn to be content. You can learn to bless the Lord. Matter of fact, we are commanded to bless the Lord at all times. And we were last night just talking about how important all of this is. Over here in 2 Corinthians chapter 4... You know, Paul in this fourth chapter was talking about how it seemed like that the apostles, he was talking about himself and Silas and some of the other apostles, had um, been set forth as it was last. They suffered more adversity than anybody else. They were persecuted and yet the people they were ministering to were blessed. And they were rejected and yet the people they ministered to were esteemed. And uh, he was saying all of these things about what was going on in his life. And then in 2 Corinthians 4... 16, he says, For which cause we faint not, but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. So he was making reference to, the, you know, when, when you talk about rejoicing and praising God, some people think, well, yeah, it's because you don't have any problems. The Apostle Paul had plenty of problems. Amen. What are we doing, Charlie? Is there something that you... Oh, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I thought you had a tray with something on it, you know, from uh, back there at the back. I didn't know what you was doing. So anyway, when you talk about praising God, sometimes people think, well, yeah, it's because you don't have my problems. And you know, the scripture says, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, 
It says, there is no temptation taking you, but such as is common to men. Common to men. That means that everybody has the same things. And the moment you get to thinking that your situation is unique, the moment you get to thinking that nobody knows the trouble I've seen, then it doesn't matter what anybody says, what we minister from the Word of God, you immediately exempt yourself and just take yourself away from God being able to move in your life. You need to recognize that all of us are fighting the same things. It's just a little bit different variation. It's a different uh, wrapping and a different bow on the package, but the content is all the same thing. And Paul here is a great example because here he is talking about rejoicing and praising God, and yet he says his outward man is perishing. Paul was having problems. There was uh, physical things coming against him, physically all the persecution, and of course as you get older you deal with some things. Paul was admitting that his outward man was perishing, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. And then he said in verse 17, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So remember that what I felt like the Lord wanted me to encourage us to do is just to be rejoicing and praising God. And if you are ever going to be effective at that, you've got to get to a place to where this is... You totally disconnect your praise and rejoicing from circumstances that go on around you. Because we live in a corrupted world. We live in a fallen world. If you never bump into the devil, it's because both of you are headed the same direction. If you turn around and do anything for God, I guarantee you, you're going to be persecuted. You are going to have problems. And there are going to be problems in your life. If you don't have problems, something's wrong with you because the Bible says all those who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And yet, all of that being said, we have these commands to rejoice in the Lord always. How can you do it? Well, the Apostle Paul here has given us great insight because look at this. In verse 17, he says, Our light affliction... And he gives two reasons why it was just a light affliction. But you know, turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It's just a few pages over. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul lifted, listed what some of his light afflictions were. And so he said in um, verse 18, 2 Corinthians eleven eighteen, 18, Seeing that many glory in the flesh... I will glory also. For you suffer fools gladly, seeing you yourselves are wise. For you suffer if a man bring you into bondage, if a man devour you, if a man take of you, if a man exalt himself, if a man smite you on the face. You know, he's taking a lot for granted here. Most Christians today don't do this. But the Christians of this day that he was writing to, he was saying you suffer with all of these other people today. Not very many Christians suffer with all this stuff. But anyway, he says in verse 21, he says, I speak as concerning reproach as though we had uh, been weak. How be it wherein so any is bold, I speak foolishly, I'm bold also. You know what I believe he's speaking about is that normally he wouldn't have boasted, he wouldn't have bragged about these things. This is a way a fool, a lost man would be. But since the people wouldn't follow his logic, he says, all right, you're on this carnal level, I'm going to get down and talk, talk carnally to you in a way that you can understand. And you know, I've done this with people before. You sit there and you try and reason with them from Scripture, but they just don't honor or believe or accept Scripture. And so you just get down. And I remember doing this when I was teaching on healing. I said, all right, I know a lot of you don't believe this. This is what the Word says, but you don't believe it. Most people don't let the Word get in the way of what they believe very much. Amen. <laughs> uh, this is just the way we've always believed. And here's what the Word says, but who cares? And so I just said... All right, well, let me just reason with you carnally. I said, I hadn't been sick in 40 years, 30-something years. And uh, right after I made that statement, I got sick because I'd been traveling. And um, anyway, it's a long story. But I had to get on television and say I finally got sick. For one, time in, um, one time in 40 years, I've been sick. But you know what? Until you get to where you're having as good a results, then maybe you ought to listen to somebody else's opinion who's getting a better results than you're getting. But see, that's a similar type of thing. In other words, you would like to use the Scripture to reason with people, but not everybody will receive that. So you just get down and say, all right, if you want to 
just talk results. Here's, here's the way it is. And this is what Paul is talking about. He says he's going to brag on himself and on the things he suffered the way a lost man was. And in verse 22, he says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. In other words, he wasn't inferior to anybody else who was criticizing him. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool like a lost man. Normally, he wouldn't have bragged on himself this way. He says, I'm more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. You need to think about this. Paul is talking about that he had been beaten with whips so many times he couldn't even count them all. Is there anybody in here who's been beaten with whips so many times that you lost count? I bet you there's not a person in here. Just think about that. A minister who had been beaten with whips so many times that he had lost count of how many times that was. Um, he says in prisons more frequent. You know, it's possible that maybe somebody in here has gone to prison for preaching the gospel, but it's not likely. But you know, this was normal with him. When Paul went into a town, we go to look at the Best Western or we make a reservation at the Holiday Inn, Paul would go check the jail, see if they had an opening. <laughs> he says, save me a spot. I'll be there before I leave. He was in prison more than anybody else in deaths off. And you know, this isn't explained. We don't know exactly what this is talking about. There was an instance where Paul is, was stoned and left for dead. And my personal opinion was that he was dead. If he wasn't dead, he was so close to it that the people who were trying to kill him thought he was dead and walked off. And as the disciples stood round about him, he rose up and went into the next town and preached. So we don't know exactly, but Paul right here said that he had been in deaths often. And then he said, uh, of the Jews, five times received I 40 stripes, save one. Now he said he had lost count of all of it, but he could remember five times that he got 39 stripes. That's amazing. He says, thrice I was beaten with rods. I heard a man one time say that the way they'd do this, they'd hang you up and they'd take uh, rods and hit you on the back of your legs and on the back of your feet to where they'd break those bones so that it was extremely painful. And, and once you got through with it, you were maimed for life. And, and uh, he says that he had received this um, three times. And once he was stoned, that's the instance I was talking about, and I believe that he actually was dead, or if he wasn't, he was close to it and rose up and walked 20-something miles the next day and preached. He says, three times I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I have been in the deep. You know, we don't even have that record in the book of Acts. Man, he suffered a lot of things that weren't even given and explained. And yet here he is just making reference to the fact that for a night and a day he had been in the deep uh, because of his faith in the Lord. In journeyings often, in perils of water, in perils of robbers. He doesn't have that listed in the book of Acts either. In perils by mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all of the churches. So here's a list of some of his... Light afflictions. And you know what? If you go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, he says, our light afflictions. See, some people just dismiss this as saying, well, the problem is Paul just didn't have the same problems I've got. He didn't have all of these things. How many would like to trade with the Apostle Paul? I guarantee you, I was talking to Mike Miller, and he was telling me about some of the things that happened to him. He stood up and prophesied here last year, and he had... Churches would double and triple. And he said he went home and his cut in half. <laughs> he said he's not prophesying this year. Amen. <laughs> and you know what? Even though that's tough and even though that might be bad, man, that's nothing like what the Apostle Paul went through. And yet the Apostle Paul says it's just a light affliction. So let me say this. If the Apostle Paul's Problems were bigger than ours, more severe than ours, and yet he says they're a light affliction. 
That le- means that there is no justification for us talking about how big our problems are and how heavy our burden is. It is not your problem that's the problem. It's the way you process it that's the problem. It's the way that you look on it. It's the way that you place value on different things. The Apostle Paul had more problems than any of us, and yet he says, it's just a light affliction. Well, that's awesome. That's awesome. You know, at one of our minister's conferences right here, I remember that there was a couple that came and they had had some problems and they, you could tell by looking at them that they had problems. They were depressed and discouraged. And I remember Dave Duell walking, they were right over on the right hand side of the stage and I remember he walked over and he prophesied and he says, my little children, don't feel bad. If I wasn't God, I'd be discouraged too. (laughs) And we all started laughing at it. You know what? This couple didn't laugh. I'm not sure. That might have been the last time they were ever here. I'm not sure. But. And I told this story recently, and I had somebody write in to me just this last week and say, how dare you make fun of people? You don't understand when people are grieving and when they're suffering. And they criticized me for even recounting that story. But you know, what we're trying to do is to say that we aren't saying that you don't have problems, but in comparison to the supply the need is really insignificant. Compared to what God has done for us, there is no comparison. And when you get into faith and when you get into walking the way that the Lord is talking about right here, you ought to be able to look at whatever your problem is. You ought to be looking at rejection from people, lack of finances, criticism, failure, whatever it is that's going on in your life, and you ought to be able to say, it's just a light affliction. It's not a big deal. And if you are under a heavy burden and if it is so big of a thing that you think everybody ought to get down and and be discouraged too, right with you, then I think that, you know what, you have a serious problem. You aren't processing this. You aren't looking at it correctly. You aren't putting things into their proper context. The Apostle Paul here had worse problems than any of us and he says, it's just a light affliction. And he says, use me as an example. Do things the way that I do. Every person in here ought to be able to look at whatever it is, whatever the challenges are in your life, and you ought to be able to say, it's just a light affliction. It's no big deal. Amen? Amen. Somebody said, but they told me I'm going to die. It's no big deal. It's not that big of a deal. I believe in healing, but what if you didn't get healed? You go to be with Jesus, that's not that bad of a deal. It's just a light affliction. There's nothing big. You know, I had a woman that, uh, some of you heard me tell this story, but uh, I used to go to a church up here in Green Mountain Falls, and there was a woman who her and her husband got married. They were a young couple, and she wanted a dozen kids. She told everybody she was going to have a dozen kids, which she questioned her wisdom. But uh, that's what she wanted. And anyway, she was so excited. And they were ministers, and so they traveled, and after being out on the field for a while, they came back and... uh, she told everybody that she was pregnant. When she got back, she went to the doctor and found out it wasn't a pregnancy. It was a tubular pregnancy, right? Is that correct? I always get this all wrong. But anyway, it turned out she wasn't pregnant. They said that she was in serious uh, danger of losing her life. They had to do a complete hysterectomy on her, and they, she only had a 50% chance of living if they did the hysterectomy. Without it, she would be dead in just weeks or months. And so anyway, um, and, you know, she went from having this hope that she was going to have children to where it looked like she was just barely going to survive it, if at all, and be unable to have any children. And so I'd heard about this, and I was talking to somebody, and we were laughing and cutting up, and she came up and tapped me on the shoulder, and when I turned around, she was just crying. And she said, Andrew, did you hear what the doctors told me? And I said, yeah, and, she, and, and I said... Cancer is no big deal, or it's not cancer. All right, so whatever. I said, cancer is no big deal. And I just started laughing. And it's just like I slapped this woman in the face. She was crying and feeling so bad about all of her situation. And when I said that, she just stopped and looked at me, and she says, would you and Jamie come over to my house and talk to me and my husband? So we went over and sat down and talked to them. They showed us all the doctor's reports. They told us what the doctor said. And they said, what should we do? And I said, well, I can't tell you. I said, it's your decision. 
But I said, if you're believing for kids, I can guarantee you, you aren't going to have any kids if you let them cut out all of your female parts. And I said, cancer's not any harder to heal than a cold. I said, it's not a big deal. The only thing that makes it a big deal is that it puts fear in you. To you, cancer is big. But it doesn't take any more power of God to heal cancer than it takes to heal a cold. And you know what? God just opened up her heart. And she believed. And she says, man, we're going to stand and believe God. And so she told the doctor she wasn't taking any of this treatment. And of course, they started blasting her with all kinds of unbelief and And finally, when she just refused to submit to their treatments, they made her sign pages and pages and pages of legal documents that would absolve them of liability. And I forget how long ago that was, but it's been at least 15 years ago, and she's had four or five kids, all natural childbirth at home because no doctor would deliver them. Amen. And so what I'm saying is some people say, well, you should sit there and feel this person's pain. And the scripture does say that you weep with those that weep. And I'm not, in, I'm not not compassionate. Some people think I am. But you know what? I just believe that really nothing is that big of a deal. There is no reason for us to ever have something that just stops all of the commands about rejoice in the Lord always. Bless the Lord at all times. If you are believing, you're rejoicing with joy unspeakable and full of glory. In the world, you're going to have tribulations, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. We've got all of these commands how to deal with things, and yet most people think, well, yes, that's true, unless... And then they have limits on how far this goes. This, this only applies in minor things. Headaches, hangnails, <laughs> athlete's foot. If I have something that I can still live with, well, then yes, I'm going to still praise God. But most people really believe that there's certain things that you are not only justified, something's wrong with you if you just don't gripe and complain and if it doesn't bother you. And I don't believe that that's true. I believe that in all things, we are supposed to rejoice in the Lord always. In all things, we're supposed to be thankful. And I believe that if the Apostle Paul, who listed all of these things, can sit there and talk about it, it's just light affliction. It's no big deal. Well, then you know what? Any of us can do it. And I'm aware that this is counterculture, religious culture, our secular world today, but I believe that it is a godly attitude, and we ought to be rejoicing regardless of what's going on. Amen. Amen. So Paul gave us two reasons here why he was able to say that his affliction was just a light affliction. First of all, he says it's just for a moment. You know, this would really help if you just put everything into perspective. You know, I don't know if you keep a journal or um, diary or something like that, but I do. And I go back and I read some of the things going on. And you know what? If I didn't read it in my own journal, I would have forgotten about it. Some of the things that, you know, were a problem that day. You go back, and in a year's time, you go back and look at it, and I'd totally forgotten it. It wasn't a big deal. The truth is, we tend to make big deals out of things that aren't big deals. And if you, right now, whatever you're dealing with, you know, a thousand years from now, is it going to be impacting you? After you've been in heaven for a thousand years, is it going to be a big deal? And you know what, if it's not, well, then it's no big deal. That's what Paul said. It's just for a moment. He looked at everything in the light of eternity. You know, when Pastor Bob was talking about visiting with Oral Roberts, I was thinking about, you know, every one of us, if the Lord tarries, and if we are healthy enough, we're going to be old someday. And if people came and asked us, what's the highlights of our life? I, you know, I can guarantee you none of us are going to be talking about the size house that we lived in or any of these kind of things. It's going to be our relationship with the Lord. And you know what? We'll, when, you're, when you're looking from 90 years back, your perspective is totally different. And we need to keep that perspective now. I believe that this is what the Apostle Paul was saying. He says, it's just a light affliction. It's just for a moment. It's not going to last. I have people come up, come up and say, well, I've been praying for months or a year. And they think that, that, you know, if it goes a certain length of time, well, then that is justification for them now being upset and depressed because after all, I've been struggling with this thing for a year. A year's not a long time. It's not a big deal. 
It's not like, you know, faith has an expiration date on it and you can only believe for so long. You know, you just... I had a guy uh, I was playing golf with a couple of weeks ago and he's a graduate of our Bible school and this guy always is after me to use my faith on golf. He says, you need to go to confessing. You aren't speaking right and he's always after me and every time I play with him, I play worse than I ever play any other time. And you know what I think it is? I just resent, I resent using my faith on golf. I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but this is just the way I feel. Like there's things more important to me than golf. And whether I have a good golf game or not is not a big deal. But you know what? If I was to use my faith, if this was going to become a faith project with me, I would win. I don't start something and just do it, you know, for a day or two or a week or something. If, I, if something becomes a faith project with me, if I started using my faith on golf, I guarantee you I'd be a good golfer. I would stick with it until I became good. I just resent thinking, you know, that you have to sit there and believe God. And so as a result, every time he gets around and you say, you need to confess this, I just go into it more blasé than I ever do and I wind up <laughs> shooting worse than I ever do around anybody else. But my point for bringing that up is that, see, when I start believing for something, it wouldn't matter if it's a cold or if it's a headache or if it's a tooth or if it's something else. If I start believing for something, I will win that battle. I don't care how long it takes. And it doesn't matter to me. I don't have an expiration date on it that, all right, I'm going to stand and believe for an hour or a day or a week. And if I don't see results, well, then I'm going another route. Man, there is no, there is no retreat. Once I start believing for something, I'm going to believe and I'm going to win. And I believe that this is what it's talking about, that you just need to recognize that, man, we are in this thing for the long haul. It doesn't matter if it takes you a day, a week, or a year. Who cares? You just go to believing God and don't put an expiration date on it. You look at things in the light of eternity. And this is what the Apostle Paul was talking about. When you do that, it just shrinks your problems down to where it's not that big of a deal. You know, I've used this example a lot, and I know that some of you have heard this, but it's just the best example I've got. But when I go to Charlotte every year, there's a guy that's a partner, and he has me speak at his uh, business. And so, I don't know, 10 years ago or something like that, I went in, and he has like 30 employees. He tells them the clock is running. You're on my time. Listen to this guy talk as long as he wants to. And about 10 years ago, I was in there, and the Lord just touched people's hearts. And we saw about 10 of those 30 employees born again. People were healed. Great things happened. And they came back to a break room after I got through talking, and I ministered to them. And this one woman came in, and she had tried to commit suicide the day before. She had cut her wrist. And uh, this was her first day back to work. She was in her third or fourth marriage. She was an alcoholic. Her husband was an alcoholic. I went over to her house, and I mean, it was... It was poor. It was trash. It was, it was terrible place. Terrible. So her whole life, she had a bad existence. And anyway, she came in, and she was crying, and she says, I'm not a Christian like you and Chip, the owner of this business. But she says, I know that prayer works, and would you please pray for me? She says, my husband filed for a divorce. That's the reason I tried to kill myself yesterday. And if I go through another divorce, I just can't live with it. She says, would you please pray for me? And so she had this bad situation. It was a bad situation. But I just, I spoke to her and I said, now let me ask you some questions. I want to make sure I understand this. She says, you aren't a Christian and you know that you aren't a Christian. And she says, that's right. And I said, if you were to die right now, you would go directly to hell. And she said, I would. And I said, and you want me to pray for your marriage and not pray for your salvation? And she said, yeah. And I said, lady, do you realize that after you burned in hell for a thousand years, you won't give a rip whether this marriage worked out or not? I said, who cares about your marriage? And it's just like I slapped her. She just stopped and looked at me. And she says, you know, you're right. She says, I need to be saved. And I said, I think you do. And so we prayed and we got her saved. Amen. And then I prayed for her marriage. I'm not saying that God doesn't care about your marriage, but I'm saying that if you were to put things into the light of eternity, 
you know what? Some people, well, I'm suffering in this marriage. I couldn't rejoice if I've got marriage problems. If they told me that I'm going to be divorced, I should be grieving. I should be sorrowful. I should be having pain in my life. Why? Rejoice in the Lord always. Well, how could you rejoice going through a divorce? If nothing else, quote that scripture, it says in heaven, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's only temporary. Amen. You could look at the scripture where he says, I've engraven you on the palms of my hand. He'll never divorce us. He'll never leave us nor forsake us. And you could say, Father, you know what? I probably have some responsibility in this marriage failing I probably deserve this, at least to a degree. Thank you that you'll never divorce me. And you could find comfort and you could be praising God for that. I'm telling you, there is a way to praise God regardless of what you're going through. There is a way to look at this thing in the light of eternity. And if you, you know, it doesn't matter what people are saying to you. It, it says uh, in Matthew chapter 6, Jesus said that if you are persecuted for righteousness sake, it says rejoice and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven. We conveniently forget that scripture quite a bit. But there are some of you that I guarantee you, you've suffered and criticism and things, people have come out against you, and we just sit there and, oh God, did you hear what they've said about me? But you know, if you put it into the light of eternity in heaven, you are going to receive supernatural compensation. God's compensation is going to be greater than the need, greater than the hurt. God is going to pay you back more. It, you can actually get to a place that the Apostle Paul spoke about this in Philippians chapter 3, and he says, I want to know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His suffering." I know that many of you in here have experienced this when people go to criticizing you or you get persecuted and things happen. You know, the Lord just dumps extra love out on you. It's like He blesses you and, and compensates you even more. And it can get to a place that, like the Apostle Paul that you actually look forward to criticism because you know that God's going to bless you. Amen. It's kind of like when you have a fight with your wife, you look forward to making up. Amen. But you can get to where you have respect under the recompense, under the pain back. And you can get to a place to where your reward is so great that you actually enjoy. You look forward. You want to know the fellowship of His sufferings. And so if we were thinking properly, even if people are criticizing you, even if something happened, even if you've been maligned and somebody has falsely accused you, you know what? You can shout and leap for joy, for great is your reward in heaven. I just don't believe that there is any situation that this doesn't apply to. Again, most people, you know, it's like they build a perimeter. They put a boundary up and they say, anything within these confines, yes, I'm going to praise God as long as it's minor and it's something that fits your deal. But then there are exceptions, like a divorce. I can't praise God if I'm going through a divorce. I can't praise God if the doctor says I'm going to die. I can't praise God if my church is split. I can't praise God if people are criticizing me. I believe that we just need to take away all of those restrictions. And one of the ways to do that is, to, like the Apostle Paul, just say it's just for a moment. You know what? If people criticize you for 30, 40, 50 years, it's just for a moment compared to eternity. It's just a brief period of time. But I've got this problem. It's just for a moment. I mean, if it lasted your entire life, it's nothing compared to eternity. You're going to spend a long time in eternity. You just go to thinking about things in the light of eternity, and you know what? It shrinks your problems right down to where there's really nothing that's very big. You know, this friend of mine, Clifton Coulter, he used to speak in our school, being one of our instructors. He, he used this expression. He says, the devil will put a toothpick in your path. And by the time you get through looking at it, it magnifies and it becomes this huge ball bat and the devil's just beating your brains out with this toothpick that you've allowed him to turn into a ball bat. And it's really kind of like that, that we just take things and get offended when there's really no need. I've had people come to me in prayer lines. I bet you that most of you in ministry can, can verify this. That I've had people come and tell me their problems and it's all I can do to keep from laughing. Like, that's it? This is what's got you derailed? I tell you what, people let things bother them that it's nearly funny the things that bother people. I had one of our Bible college students, Bobby Crow, knows this guy, Meredith. 
he walked in when he was going to Bible college here. And he walked into my office one day and he was just crying uncontrollably. And after I calmed him down, I said, Meredith, what's wrong? And he says, oh, the devil just stole the word from me. And I said, what happened? And he said, I went to church yesterday and I was so hungry to hear the word. And there were two women sitting in front of me who just talked all the time, back and forth, and I couldn't stay focused on the scripture and I wasn't able to hear the service. And he says, the devil stole the word and he was just crying. And I said, why didn't you move? He never thought of that. He rebuked and bound the devil and did everything, but he never thought of moving. And you know, I had just gotten off the phone just a few minutes before he walked into my office with a friend of mine whose wife had died. They'd been married 50 years. And his wife had just died. And I'd called him to see how he was doing. And he says, oh man, God is awesome. God is such a good God. God's taking care of me. He had lost his mate of 50 years and he was praising God and drawing on the ability of God. And here's a guy who came in because people in front of him were talking. I tell you, I just wanted to drop kick him right out of my office. Boom. And you know what? If you were to look at things in the light of eternity, that's really the way that all of our situations are. Compared to God and eternity and the whole scheme of things, did you know the problems that we have? It's no big deal. It's no big deal. Man, again, Mike and Marilyn Miller, you know, I, I'm not insensitive to the fact that you prophesy and half of your church leaves because somebody maligned you. I, I'm aware that that's a deal. But you know what? Jesus preached and he had thousands of people come and want to make him king. And he says, you don't really want me to be king. You just are following me because you ate of my food. I fed you. I multiplied the food. And so he started saying, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you have no life in you. And they thought he was speaking of cannibalism. And instead of trying to explain himself and say, that this is spiritual. Now, I want you to understand this. Don't anybody take offense. <laughs> instead of that, he says, verily I say unto you, if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. And man, they all turned around and left. Thousands of people left. And you think Jesus was discouraged? He turned around to his disciples and he says, do you want to leave? He says, are you going to leave too? Most people think, well, that was Jesus. You know what? You can do the same thing. You put it into the light of eternity and I guarantee you, you do what God tells you to do and it doesn't matter if it hair lips the devil, if anybody understands what's going on. You just do what God tells you to do and someday in eternity, I guarantee you, God is going to bless you. You can't compare yourself with other people. God called you to do something unique and you just do what God told you to do and you be faithful and praise God. There's going to be awesome rewards for that. Awesome rewards for it. And so you got to put it into the light of eternity and quit just focusing on one, your one little problem. I've had people come up in prayer lines before and they're just, oh, would you please pray for me? Nothing in my life is going right. And you know, the few people that I've known their background, I remember this one couple that they were miraculously saved. I mean, they were into the drug culture. They should not have even encountered the Lord, but God sought them out. They were miraculously saved. Their marriage was healed. They were healed of cancer. They should have been dead. They had already had all of these wonderful things happen to him, and yet here they were dealing with a little financial problem that wasn't working, and they just had their blinders on looking only at this, and they forgot the perspective of all that God had done for them. And you know what? I just started standing there and I started saying, so nothing ever goes right for you. I said, well, what about when you got saved? What about how the Lord saved your marriage? Or how about the Lord healed you? And you know what? I just started putting things into perspective for them. Getting their mind off of just the momentary problem and letting them remember all of the good things that have happened. You know, as we're talking about praising God, one of the ways that I praise God is I constantly am going back and rehearsing what God has done in my life. 
If you aren't a thankful person, if you don't go back and rehearse your victories and think about, man, how Jesus saved you. Thinking of Dave Hinton here coming out of what, the devil's den? Demon's den coming out of a bar and a little old lady witnessing to him and he got born again. What an awesome miracle that this guy was going to hell and Jesus just sent people out there to witness to him. And you know what? I can guarantee you David and Cindy have had problems, but boy, you go back and think about, but God, it doesn't matter what happens. You've forgiven me of my sins. Man, if the worst, worst happens, I die. I go right into the very presence of God. I live forever in a mansion on streets that are paved of gold. I get rewards. I get all of these kind of things. When you get this kind of perspective, you know what? Really, not much can compare to it. And you know, in some ways, I really think that spirit-filled Christians are weaker in this area than the denominational people. Because spirit-filled Christians are believing for healings and prosperity and anointing and power and victory and things. Our expectation is higher than people who don't have those kind of expectations. And it says in Proverbs chapter 13, verse 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. You know, denominational people, they aren't believing for healing. So when they get sick, they aren't disappointed. It's kind of what they expected. They don't have to deal with their heart being made sick. They don't have a lot of expect expectations. They're all thinking about heaven when we all get to heaven. And so they may not... You know, it doesn't bother some people when they get sick with the flu because, after all, we're only human and that's what they expect. But if you're believing God for healing and then all of a sudden you don't see that come to pass... I find Christians that are burdened down and depressed and discouraged about why aren't I able to live in victory and why aren't I able to do all of these kind of things. And it's because our expectations are so high. So in some ways, I really believe that spirit-filled Christians are sometimes more discouraged, more dealing with depression because they have so much more that they're believing for in this life, whereas most other Christians, it's all off in the future someplace. One of the ways that you cope with that is to go back and remember what God has already done for you, how good God has been. You know what I believe? I, there's a lot of things. God has just stirred me up in the last few weeks. I'm in another stage where I'm just beginning to see a huge expansion, and there's a lot of things coming, and you know, there's a lot of challenges, and there's a lot of potential problems, and, and anytime you go to believing for stuff... You know, there's all these things. But, you know what, if, if nothing else happened in my life, if I was just to go back and look at how good God has been to me and what He's done in my life, and if I was to go back and, you know, I'm seeing Ashley and Carly back there and their little daughter, Hannah, that was healed. And if you just see that one little girl's life that was healed because of that, you know what, I could just... I could start rejoicing and praising God. I don't care what's going on. And who, you know, I am believing that all of the things God's got for me are going to be accomplished. But if, if I never did anything else and if I failed from here on, you know what? God has already blessed me. God has already been good. And I could be rejoicing and thanking God for how good He's been. And I believe that every one of us, if nothing else, you ought to be praising God for your salvation. You ought to be praising God that you heard about the baptism of the Holy Spirit and have that revelation. You ought to be praising God for the privilege and the honor of being in the ministry and called to the ministry. And you could go through, and if you were just to be counting your blessings and thinking about what God has done for you, and you put your current problem in perspective. That's what Paul was doing when he says, it's just for a moment. See, he was looking forward to heaven. He was looking back at what God had already done. And when you put things into perspective, it's just like looking through a pair of binoculars through the big end and out the small end. It just shrinks your problem down to nothing. You could look at Pike's Peak and it just becomes this big. You just reach out and grab it. It's no big deal. Amen. You can look at the cancer. You can look at what the doctor's saying. You can look at all the criticisms and it's no big deal compared to God loving you. You know, I get a lot of people that criticize me, and I don't get as much as I used to. Most of my staff screens it now, so I don't see all of the stuff. But I still get criticism. I had a couple of critical uh, emails this week, people uh, saying things to me. But you know what? The way I deal with that is I go back and think, but God, 
You love me. You have done this. You've said these things. And you know what? You put it into the perspective. You compare it to how much God loves you. Who cares what somebody else has to say? And a lot of people misunderstand and think that I'm just insensitive. Well, I, you know, I guess I am insensitive to other people. I really am, I guess. I'm more sensitive to what God has to say than what people have to say. I remember a guy at one of my meetings came up in Kansas City, and he started reaming Jamie out over the way she dressed. And it wasn't anything wrong with the way she dressed. He was a Pentecostal who believed her hair should be in a bun, and she shouldn't have any makeup on, and she was of the devil because she wore a gold ring. And he just started reading the riot act to Jamie and telling me, you need to get your wife into gear and into line and you need to do this and this and this. And I just stopped this guy right in the middle of it. And I said, who died and made you God? And he just stopped and looked at me and he says, what do you mean? I said, you're nobody. I said, you don't have any right to... Wow, how dare you say that about me? I'm a believer. And I said, you know what? I just don't give a rip what you think. Your opinion doesn't mean anything to me. I said, you have no right to speak into our life. And this guy got offended, but you know what? I didn't get offended. I I didn't have his criticisms. It didn't keep me up at night. I just didn't value his opinion. And it's not that I don't value people. It's just that I value God so much more. It's like in comparison, it's no big deal. Amen. I nearly spent all of the time on that one deal. The second thing he talked about is, he says, Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory, while we look not at the things that are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You know, this, this is just so simple that we miss this. But he says he's looking at things that can't be seen. If they can't be seen, then how are you looking at them? This is through faith, with the eyes of your heart. And brothers and sisters, this is the way that you keep your problems from being so big is you have to look at them through the eyes of faith. If all you are doing is looking with your physical eyes, if all you are doing is looking at the financial situation and listening to the banker or listening to the auditor or the accountant tell you that, you know what, you're coming to the end, you're going to be bankrupt in this amount of time. If all you're doing is looking and thinking in the natural realm, then something would be wrong with you if you weren't bothered. Because you know what, we live in a corrupted world. We live in a fallen world. There are bad things going on. Again, I can use the example of the financial situation. If all you do is look with your physical eyes, then you know what? This ought to be a time for people to be concerned and be worried about different things. But if you look at things through spiritual eyes, everything looks totally different. Everything is totally, totally different. Totally different. And the problem is that most of us are just looking with our physical eyes. We aren't looking at things through faith. You know, I had a situation when we first published, our our first major book that I ever published was this 600-page Life for Today Gospels edition. And back at that time, our ministry was very small, and uh, it was going to cost me... They gave me a price of like forty or fifty thousand dollars to print this hard brown, hardbound copy, and that would have been six months worth of income. It was a huge, huge step for us, and yet we had we found a guy who said that if we would go ahead and give him the money now, they were in a situation where they needed the money. If I'd give him the money right then, that they would print it for twenty six thousand dollars, which would save it was about half price. And uh, I didn't have $26,000. So what I had to do was go to my partners. I pre-sold these books. And they bought the books before they were printed. And I took that money and gave to the printer. And anyway, I remember my staff coming up to me, this guy. And he said, you know this uh, Life for Today Gospels book that you're getting printed? And the $26,000 you gave? It turned out that the salesman is a crook. He took the money and he's gone and we don't have a book. And said so they did the same thing to Nicky Cruz, to Charles Stanley. Those guys lost hundreds of thousands of dollars, but I only lost $26,000. But you know what? $26,000, it would have sunk our ministry. Plus, these people were expecting a product that now we couldn't deliver them. 
And, and the guy told me that to get the books printed now, we were going to have to pay like, I forgot what it was, 46 or something thousand dollars on top of that now to get the books printed. So altogether, I was out over $70,000, which was like a year's income. And, you know, what, what do you do? I mean within seconds. You can ask my staff. I don't know if any of my staff uh, was still around at that time, but those who were there, when that happened, I bet you it wasn't over 10 seconds or 15 seconds. I just kind of stood there thinking about this. And then the Lord brought a scripture to my memory out of Proverbs chapter 6, I believe it's around verse 20 or something. It says, if you catch a thief, he has to restore sevenfold or give all of the substance of his house to repay. And I said, man, that's awesome. And I took a pencil and I multiplied seven times whatever it was, 70,000 or whatever. And I said, our income's going to increase by this much money this year. And I started praising God. They thought that I'd lost it. And I started praising God and saying, this is going to be the most awesome thing that ever happened. Did you know that our income increased nearly to the penny, $490,000 that year? And we were able to get this book printed. And you know the difference? The reason I was able to rejoice at the midst of this terrible news that sounded like it was going to kill the ministry is because I was able to see something that couldn't be seen. I was able to see by faith instead of just being limited to your physical eyes. I want to tell you that I don't care what your situation is. If you're in the midst of a building program, if half of your church left, if you're facing financial problems, physical problems, whatever it is that you're dealing with, there is a way to see this thing through the eye of faith that will turn it around and make it a positive thing. It could actually be one of the greatest things that's ever happened to you. And if you do that, then like the Apostle Paul, you're able to say, it's a light affliction. We need $3 million in 30 days. No big deal. Amen. There's a way to look at this thing that it's not going to be a big deal. And some of you are looking at me like, no. You know, there's a lot of... One of the reasons that we started our own minister's conference is because you go to most minister's conferences and you know what it is? It's like, oh, we know that you're hurting. We're all hurting. And we just all get down and we all talk about how bad it is. And man, we're all struggling. And man, you get depressed and discouraged. Here you're getting challenged. But I'm telling you that you can rejoice in the Lord always. You can take whatever the problem is, whatever the challenge has come against you, and you can just make it a light affliction. It's no big deal. And God has given us the ability to do that. And what, before we can start operating in that, we first of all need to change our expectations from just looking at things like mere human beings and expecting to get the same results that an unbeliever gets or a denominational Christian that doesn't have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We need to start acting like people that are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit and operating in the supernatural and doing things that aren't humanly natural. We, we need to be supernatural. We need to expect the supernatural. Amen? And I'm telling you that God loves us. God is a good God. And they, he, His goodness is so good that whatever you're facing, the badness doesn't even compare. Over in Romans chapter 8, it says, I reckon that the sufferings of this current world, present world, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Did you know that whatever you're suffering right now, it isn't even worthy to be compared with what God has already done for you and what your future has planned for you. If we were to start putting things in the, in the perspective of eternity, looking back at the goodness of God, looking forward to all of the things that have promised for us, if we start walking by faith and seeing by faith instead of walking by the natural realm, then there is not an excuse for a person in here to be depressed or discouraged. You ought to be encouraged. Because the supply is greater than your need. And you know, when you develop this attitude, it not only is going to help you through a rough time, but it's contagious. The world is so negative that when you start speaking positively and speaking faith, I guarantee you it makes you stand out like a heel thumb. 
when everybody else is going to get up and preach about the financial crisis and how you need to protect yourself and man, start really praying hard. We need to intercede. We need to bind. We need to loose this. We need to rebuke the demons. And You get in and you're expressing fear and doubt and frustration and stuff from the pulpit. I guarantee you that affects the people. But when you can stand up and preach that my God's going to supply my need according to His riches in glory, that attracts people. Pastor Bob, again, when they lost their church building, they went and had to meet in, uh, what was that, the Will Rogers Auditorium? And they had to rent that. And uh, I mean, the news people said it's like they won the lottery. And people, their church attendance began to increase after all of this devastation because people wanted to come see these people, these crazy people that were rejoicing in the midst of all of these problems and acting so happy. I guarantee you. There'll be people criticize you, but you go out and start talking about the goodness of God and start rejoicing. And there is a positive answer to every negative thing that the devil is doing. And it's our responsibility to present that. If we don't present it, I guarantee you the news isn't going to present it. And the vast majority of churches aren't going to be presenting it. They're going to be looking at things from a standpoint of how to survive instead of thrive. And we need to, be, we need to become positive. And the thing to me that makes this happen is just a commitment, a philosophy that, you know what, I'm going to praise God. I don't care what happens. I don't care if they tell me my son is dead. I don't care if they tell me that the economy has failed. I don't care if they tell me anything. I'm going to find some way to praise God. I'm going to find the positive side to this, and I'm going to rejoice in the Lord always. And it keeps you positive. Amen. 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 You all agree? Yes. Hallelujah. Father, we love you and we just thank you for these truths. And Father, if Paul could make his afflictions light because of this mindset, I believe that we can. And Father, I'm asking for every person in here that you would help us to turn these negative things into positives. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I believe people are going to move from the pit to the palace through this mindset. I believe that we're going to move from one side of the Red Sea to the other because we praise you. I thank you like Jehoshaphat that we go out and set the singers in the front and we go out and win the battle supernaturally by singing, Praise the Lord for your mercy endures forever. Father, we believe that regardless of whatever Satan has planned, we refuse to put so much value on that that it devalues what you've done. We exalt you. We believe that your supply is greater than the need. And we just choose to put it into the light of eternity. We choose to see with faith. And Father, we are going to praise you and thank you for all of the good, good things that you're doing in our lives. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We agree and we receive it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Well, I need to let you go. We've got Bible college students that got to go to work. And uh, other people got to go golfing. But you know what? You are blessed. Amen. Hug somebody and tell them how much you love them and you can be dismissed. For more of Andrew's teaching and other resources, please visit our website at awmi.net. Or for prayer and additional information, call our helpline at 719-635-1111. Again, that's 719-635-1111.